Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to be going over chapter 13 of the American pageant titled The Rise of a Mass Democracy from 1824 to 1840. As always, we're going to be using the 16th edition of the American pageant. If you have an earlier or later edition or a completely different textbook, don't worry about it. The content's going to be the same. To start off, here are the key concepts for this chapter. These are located at the beginning of every chapter in the American pageant. I always say this, but um, personally what I like to do is after I read the chapter, I connect the key terms to each of the bullet points and this will really help you organize the information so i definitely recommend you try it because it will really help you sort of understand and process information so that you can use it automatically on an leq or a dvq or even a short answer anything really um, so i definitely recommend that you try that okay so to start off let's talk about the elections of 1824 and 1828 these are super important mostly because unlike the previous decades these elections led to the introduction of strong political parties as it became evident that they were necessary in a healthy democracy and this juxtaposed or contradicted the traditional view of them as disruptors in a harmonious society people believed that having political parties would prevent really the unification of the country which was critical because there were some rising sectionalist tensions at the time and people saw that uh, political parties only worsened this and that in order to accomplish anything for the sake of the nation you would have to come up with a collective compromise or something along those lines and this really strayed away from uh washington's perspective that there shouldn't be political parties which we saw in his farewell address and it also allowed for some parties to advocate for certain communities um, which became critical especially in you know the following decades with the north and the south and slavery becoming an increasingly contentious issue and political parties make a strong entrance in the election of 1824 which came to be known among jacksonites or supporters of andrew jackson who was running in the election of 1824 as the corrupt bargain of 1824 so let's talk about that to provide some background the candidates for the election were james monroe john quincy adams henry clay william crawford and andrew jackson and what happened was andrew jackson the war hero from the west uh, from the battle of new orleans condemned the corruption and privilege in government and he was very popular but he didn't win the majority electoral vote and so the house of representatives has to choose the top three candidates that will continue in the presidential race and so henry clay who's also the speaker of the house for the house of the representatives is surprisingly kicked out but he still has a lot of power over who wins and Clay supports John Quincy Adams, who wins and chooses Clay to be the Secretary of State. And so Jackson supporters are outraged, claiming that JQA bribed Clay, oh, that rhymed, <laughs> and stated that it was a prime example of elitism that directly opposed democracy. Essentially, Jacksonites were saying that it was sort of like both sides win, and Clay was trying to get JQA into office in order to further his own ideals and to become Secretary of State because in uh, previous decades and previous administrations, those who were Secretary of State tended to become the presidents in future elections. So Jacksonites are super upset about this. And unfortunately, John Quincy Adams' presidency, unlike his earlier foreign policy efforts, were pretty uneventful. Um, JQA is mostly known for his foreign policy, notably the Monroe Doctrine, but really his presidency was uh, largely not that significant. This is mostly because a lot of people considered his presidency illegitimate. He also wasn't popular among the public. He was what was considered a minority president because uh, the people necessarily didn't elect him. It was an electoral thing. And he also had nationalistic beliefs in an era of growing sectionalism. So his beliefs are again kind of contradicting what the people want. Um, so he's very unpopular. However, this all changes in the election of 1828, and Jackson, a Democratic Republican, ends up winning the election, becoming the first president from the West, which is breaking the uh, Virginia streak. All of the previous presidents had been from Virginia, so he's really breaking that streak and setting, you know, a name for himself, um, someplace where normally Westerners wouldn't be. He called himself a common frontiersman, but in reality, he was actually pretty wealthy. And he also hyperbolized JQA's corruption. He said that John Quincy Adams was so corrupt, elitist, and all of these different things. Um, and this was kind of hypocritical because Jackson himself, well, first of all, would come to be pretty corrupt. And he was also pretty wealthy himself. He wasn't like a poor common man. He started out that way, but he was not that way 
as he ran for president. And one example of uh, Jackson's corruption is the spoil system. And in this system, Jackson would reward political supporters by giving them positions in public office. And because many of them were from the West, they were often uneducated, which meant that there was a lot of corruption and unfit people in important public office positions. Jackson countered, saying that it was actually democratic to give the common man a voice in politics. And well, yeah, it's true, everyone should be given a voice in politics, but there are certain ways of doing that, and this is literally just not going to help the entire democratic system because unfit people will make unfit decisions, and um, it will ultimately not end well, as is demonstrated during this era. Another issue that comes up in the Jacksonian presidency is the nullification crisis. So to provide a little background, Tariffs were a very controversial issue during this time. They helped new industries in the North grow without foreign competition, but they also increased the prices of domestic products and posed the risks of, quote, retaliatory tariffs abroad, where foreign nations would also impose a tariff against American exports. If America was having high tariffs, other countries would counter back with their own high tariffs to show that, you know, they aren't reliant on America or whatever. So um, this was definitely a double-edged sword and it would really highlight whether a president wanted to help out the North or the South. And obviously, the Southern agrarian society really despised these high tariffs. It was difficult for them to sell abroad, and um, they also didn't like the fact that it was benefiting the North. And you can really see this sentiment with the Tariff of Abominations in 1828. This was a bill that Jacksonites had promoted back in 1824 because they thought it would be defeated and make President JQA look bad. But in reality, it came back to bite them, and it was just really a partisan issue. The North saw the tariff as this savior. They really liked it. They were able to grow their new industries and not have to worry about other competition um, that could, you know, make better products or provide cheaper products. So this helped them in their industrial capacities. However, the South did not like the tariff. They thought it was annoying and overall unnecessary and even discriminatory towards them because um, they relied so heavily on exporting their goods. And um, Jackson inherits this tariff, which makes Southerners who rely on trade furious. And they, again, say that they're being discriminated against. And on top of all of this, there's more anxiety in the South because of the Denmark Vesey Rebellion in 1822. And essentially Denmark Vesey was a free black who led a failed slave rebellion um, in Charleston, South Carolina, and Southerners worry about federal interference with the institution of slavery. So again, they are not really trusting the federal government at the moment. Even though Jackson claims to be like a advocate for the South and West, it doesn't really translate because of these policies. And ultimately, really the tipping point is the South Carolina Exposition in 1828. And this was a document that was secretly written by Jackson's own VP, John C. Calhoun. And it said that the tariff was unconstitutional and that states could nullify it. And this tariff uh, violated the compact theory. But the compact theory said that the government and the people have an agreement. And if that agreement is broken by either side, the other side has a right and even a duty to retaliate. And so you get the nullification crisis where the South Carolina legislature declares that the tariff is null and void and threatens secession, meaning leaving the union, if the federal government tries to collect duties. So uh, everything is really in shambles right now. And even though Andrew Jackson is a partisan president, he wants to make sure that the union is saved. And so to solve this, he passes the Compromise Tariff of 1833, which was created by Henry Clay yet again and essentially resolved the crisis, but he wasn't afraid to use force because he also enacted the Force Bill of 1833, which allowed the president to use the army and navy to collect federal tariff duties if necessary. And Jackson wants to show that he can use force and he won't always back down. He's not afraid to use force if he needs to, but he's, you know, letting them go this time because the crisis was essentially resolved with the tariff. Okay, so this is probably the worst part of uh, Jackson's presidency. I'm sure we're all aware of it, but it's definitely important to just understanding the cruelty of Jackson's Indian removal policies. So yeah, Indian removal is really just indicative of how much westward expansion um, impacted the American psyche. Andrew Jackson was really willing to go these extreme lengths just to 
expand westward and it just shows how manifest destiny has completely pervaded the american psyche at this point and will continue to do so you know in the following decades as we'll see uh, even in the later 1800s and even in the later part of the 1800s so it's super important to know about that this is really a big starting point for that so to just reiterate what i said Jackson wants to expand westward, but he knew that there would be native resistance. And a lot of people actually respected the Indians and wanted to assimilate with them. They wanted to uh, coexist, unlike, you know, in, I think it was like chapter two or something. The colonists had decided um, in the anglo powhatan Wars that they could no longer assimilate with the natives. And now people are trying to change that a little bit. Some resisted assimilation, but five tribes who came to be known as the five civilized tribes agreed to this. Um, these were the Cherokee, the Creeks, the Choctaws, the Seminoles, and the Chickasaws. And they adapted to lifestyles very similar to those of whites. And when Jackson tries to do this whole Indian removal thing, he is met with some resistance, as seen in the Worcester versus Georgia case in 1832. And essentially the Georgia legislature said that the Cherokee tribal council was illegal and that it had jurisdiction over Indian lands and affairs. The Cherokee appealed to the Supreme Court and Marshall, John Marshall, the Chief Justice at the time, rules in their favor, but Jackson refuses to listen to this. So no matter what the Supreme Court says, he will not listen. And uh, you'll see this sort of belief Jackson has that the president is the most powerful being in office. And this is exemplified in his actions. He uses the veto way too many times. Just overall, the belief that he can override other people's uh, decisions with his own power. And so Jackson passes the Indian Removal Act in 1830. This forcefully removed 100,000 Indians, even the five civilized tribes, especially the five civilized tribes, which really just felt like a staff in the back to that. They had done everything to assimilate and they still were heavily impacted by this um, act. In some sense, you could say that Jackson did have some good intent. Um, he knew that westward expansion was inevitable. People would always want to be searching for new land since tobacco was destroying um, the land that people were living on and they needed more land, more space uh, for bigger families. So he knew that it was going to happen, uh, whether or not the natives wanted it. And so he intentionally wanted the natives to move somewhere else um, and preserve their culture that way. Still, the methods with which he did this were um, just indefensible. And this ultimately leads to the Trail of Tears. Um, this was a trail where tribes walked to settle in other territories, and it was excruciating and fatal, resulting in 4,000 deaths. It was um, really just a brutal journey. However, not all tribes who were forced to uh, move from their native lands complied. They resisted, and this is seen in the Black Hawk War in 1832. Um, you know, some tribes resisted the eviction uh, from their land, and as seen in this war, they were often brutally crushed. More resistance is seen with the Seminole Indians, led by Osceola, who, uh, who waged a guerrilla war, but eventually Osceola was captured by American forces and the rebellion was uh, suppressed. So really, even though the natives did put up a fight, it was not able to prevent them from getting moved somewhere else. Okay, so let's talk about the bank war. This is a really significant part um, of Jackson's presidency because it really shows his values. And you know, Jackson being from the West, he distrusted big business and monopolized banking because they printed paper money whose value often fluctuated, giving these banks plenty of power over the national economy. And the Bank of the United States, the BUS, controlled most of the nation's economy. But since it was private, it acted to the will of elite investors, not the people. And many thought the president of the BUS, Nicholas Biddle, had too much power in the nation's affairs. He controlled the literal national bank. So people generally believed that he was given way too much power than he should. And this leads to the bank war. And what happens is uh, Congress is presented with a bill to renew the charter for the Bank of the United States. Jackson vetoes it, showing his belief that the president's say is final and the ultimate power. This is one of the many vetoes that he uh, uses throughout his presidency. And somehow Jackson manages to win re-election in 18... That's 19. That says 1932. It's supposed to say 1832. Jackson wins re-election in 1832, not 1932. Um, but yeah, Jackson wants to get rid of the Bank of the United States for good. So he removed federal deposits, placing them in these 
uh, local state pro Jackson banks called pet banks. And this meant that there was no centralized bank, which meant currency and the economy in general was very disorganized and it leads to a boom and bust cycle. Remember, we saw what a um, uncentralized government did following the revolution. The Articles of Confederation government did not do much and actually hurt the nation. It was only when we got the constitution and we had a centralized power that we were actually able to get stuff done. And again, Jackson is taking away a centralized power and you're going to see chaos is about to ensue. In fact, Jackson tries to save the now failing economy by issuing Specie Circular, which said that all land must be purchased with metallic or hard money instead of paper notes. And although it stopped the speculative boom that was caused by the influx of paper notes, it also led to the Panic of 1837. So the benefits reaped from Specie Circular were minimal at best. And although you know, Jackson's intentions were kind of good. He wanted to represent the southern and western parts of the country who saw the bank as a devil. He wanted to advocate for them. It really just did more harm than it did good. Destroying the bank just got rid of the centralized power that was sort of binding the nation and really just throwing it all over the place. And this is kind of like Recyclops from the office. That's how I like to think of it. It's like, yeah, there was good intent, sort of, um, but the execution could have been a lot better. And during this time, you have a new party emerge known as the Whigs. These uh, were anti-Jacksonites, and they compared his blatant abuse of power to that similar of a monarchy. They're bringing back these feelings of, you know, a, a British crown that people are taught to despise. They also supported Northern industrialists, active government reforms, and internal improvements. And they claimed to be the People's Party. And remember, Jackson was the People's Party, but now they're saying that Jackson wasn't for the people. He was working directly against them. So this is really turning the table on the Jacksonites. Okay, so before we talk about Texas, let's talk a little bit about um, the election, specifically the election of 1836. Martin Van Buren, a Jacksonite, wins against the Whigs, um, specifically their candidate, William Henry Harrison, giving Andrew Jackson a chance to influence policy through Buren. Buren is sort of serving like a puppet for Jackson. And unfortunately for him, Jackson's mess left Buren with the Panic of 1837, which was caused by rampant speculation and land purchased on borrowed money from the pet banks. And the bank war and specie circular only worsened this. Other than that, there isn't really anything significant about Buren's um, presidency. He was really only associated with Jackson. That's really his only significance in the larger scheme of things. So let's talk a little bit about Texas. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about Texas. And you should note that the US was looking to occupy this massive area, even though it was currently occupied by Spain. However, the Mexicans, who were um, also under Spanish control, win their independence in 1821. And a man named Stephen Austin is given a large plot of land in exchange for bringing in 300 American families. So now that Mexico has gained some independence, they are officially in control of Texas and they're trying to populate the area more. But soon enough, tensions arose around slavery, immigration, and states' rights between these new families and the native Mexicans um, of Texas. And in terms of slavery, Mexico had emancipated all of their slaves by 1830. They were ahead of the game. But Americans refused to follow this rule and even brought more slaves in, which angered the Mexicans further. And the tensions were further flared when the dictator, Santa Ana, got rid of local rights and began to place an army to suppress rebellious Texans, people who wanted to keep bringing slaves in. Um, Texans declared their independence in 1836, so they're, you know, Mexico had declared their independence from Spain. Now Texas was declaring their independence from Mexico. And uh, Santa Ana, the dictator, violently battles the rebels at the Alamo. And although it was a defeat for the Texans, it galvanized them and led them to seeking independence. And at San Jacinto, the Texans capture Santa Ana, who withdraws his troops and recognizes the southernmost border of Texas to be the Rio Grande. The U.S. recognizes Texas as its own republic, but Mexico does not. Um, you know, Mexico's just like, hey, like, you're not involved in this, just stay out of it. And finally, this is kind of not related to Texas, but um, the election of 1840 is super important. Two major changes happen during this election. One, candidates have to appeal to the people. So it's better if they're poor because they aren't, you know, aristocratic or elitist. And there's also, secondly, the official formation of a two-party system, um, two national parties. But in this election, the Whigs run Tip Canoe and Tyler too, um, William Henry Harrison and his VP, John Tyler. And um, obviously, William Henry Harrison is the 
hero from Tip Canoe, and then Tyler too, John Tyler. Yeah, they win. Harrison dies almost immediately, so Tyler is now president. John Tyler is now president. And yeah, that'll do it for this chapter. Here are the credits for how we got everything you just saw. Thank you so much for watching. Comment below if you have any questions. Uh, you know, like, subscribe, do that whole thing. And uh, yeah, see you in the next chapter.